Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and polyandry advocate. When a work gets adapted from one medium to another, there's always going to be something lost in translation, and the outcome of that varies. Some adaptations will cut or change things here and there, but for the most part remain true to the letter and, more importantly, the spirit of the original. Others play fast and loose with their source material, but the story they tell is good enough on its own terms that you can usually forgive the license. And then there are adaptations like our next offender, Paint Your Wagon, where you just wonder what the here they were thinking. Both the stage and film versions of Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe's 1951 musical chronicle the rise and fall of a boom town during the California Gold Rush, but that's about where the similarities end. The stage version focused on grizzled old prospector Ben Rumson, the wife he bought off a Mormon pioneer, his daughter Jennifer, and Jennifer's Mexican love interest. The film adaptation keeps Rumson, but rolls the wife and daughter into one character, changed the Latino lover into Clint Eastwood, brought in an entirely different group of supporting characters, and replaced over half of Lerner and Lowe's score with new songs by Lerner and Andre Previn. The result is such a dismal failure that it's hard to tell what motivated the changes. Unless it was the inexplicable desire to cast Eastwood and Lee Marvin in a musical. <laughs> yeah, and you thought that was just a joke on The Simpsons. Truth really is stranger than fiction, so let's examine the case of Paint Your Wagon. Marvin is in the Ben Rumson role, and the movie begins when his day of panning for gold is interrupted by a wagon crash. Clint Eastwood has survived, but the day player cast as his brother isn't so lucky. A quickie burial is arranged, and it turns out the dirt nap, it's pay dirt. We pass out to you. This corn cracker's body and soul. To take him, and to keep him, I stake this claim for me, my new partner over there, whatever the hell his name is, forever and ever. Amen. Pull him up. Both Eastwood and Marvin have problems, so let's deal with them in order of appearance. First, Lee Marvin. Now, normally I'm lenient to singers in a musical if they sound like the character they're playing, and Marvin's singing does sound like something that would come out of a cranky, disreputable, perpetually drunk mountain man. But let's face it, that's not a sound most people would want to listen to for very long. They civilize what's pretty by putting up a city where nothing that's pretty can grow. They muddy up the winter and civilize it into a place too uncivilized even for snow. It probably wouldn't be so bad if Marvin had a sense of phrasing or musicality in his delivery, but he doesn't. It's just... what's the word I'm looking for? What is monotonous? Thank you, unbelievably intelligent and attractive mortal. The one song where Marvin's voice kind of works is Wandering Star, where he expresses a kind of thoughtful melancholy. But after about three verses of his droning, you'll be thankful when the strapping male chorus takes over. A wandering, wandering star. Now, on to Clint Eastwood as Rumson's partner, Pardner. Pardner is supposed to be the less experienced, more straight-laced foil to Ben Rumson, but Eastwood seems ill at ease playing the nice guy of the pair. He feels more like someone who would let Rumson freeze to death in the rain rather than put up with him. As for Eastwood's singing, well, as far as timber goes, I've heard worse. But he falls under the pitch a lot, and like Marvin, he doesn't have a whole lot of expression when he performs, making his songs flat musically and emotionally. I talk to the trees, but they don't listen to me. I talk to the stars. But they never hear me. You know, that explains so much. Jerry, buddy, how have you been? Haven't talked to you since you were a tree. You're in furniture now. How's that going for you? I direct movies and create bad performance art for the RNC. What, you think that's funny? Ah, to hell with you. You never listen to me anyway. A tent settlement called No Name City springs up in the wake of Rumson's discovery, and it's populated by the usual pioneer assortment the slick gambler, the heavily accented immigrants, the Ponzi guy from back east, and so on. What do they do? Well, they dance in the mud. And 
they dance some more. Out the window go the beans, out the window go the beans. And then they sit in their tents and wait out the rain. And they wait some... Look, movie, I've sat through the Hobbit films, so I have a pretty high tolerance for leisurely pacing. But we're approaching the 30-minute mark, and not only has not much happened in this movie, I haven't seen anything that makes me believe the remaining two-plus hours are going to be worth going through. If you can't show me one thing right now that might possibly make slogging through all this worth it, I am just going to drop this... ...in the... Way out here, they got a name. Oh, Arv Presnell. Thank you, sweet baby Beelzebub. A little background on our saving grace. Those of you who know him best as the dad in Fargo may be surprised to learn that Presnell was a classically trained baritone. Unfortunately, his film musical career coincided with the genre's long, slow decline into the dark age of Lost Horizon and Can't Stop the Music, so his only movie musical roles are in The Unsinkable Molly Brown, an obscure Gershwin knockoff called When the Boys Meet the Girls, and in this movie as the town card sharp Rotten Luck Willie. This is unfortunate, since he ranks alongside Julie Andrews and Gordon McRae as one of the best singers in movie history. Mariah blows the stars around and sends the clouds a flying. Mariah makes the mountain sound like folk were up there dying. His big as all outdoors voice is chillingly powerful, and a perfect pairing with the score's most famous song they call The Wind Mariah. It's pretty clear Presnell was brought onto the film just for this one number, since his character does jack all for the rest of the movie. But his performance gives Rotten Luck Willie an air of pathos and loss, which is a lot more than can be said of the main cast. He makes a bigger impression in two and a half minutes than anyone else does in nearly three hours, which is a testament to his impressive and sadly underutilized vocal talents. Mariah, does make me wonder what their weather reports sound like. Today will be partly Larry with a chance of Tess in the afternoon and up to 30 mile an hour Mariah in some areas. The weekend forecast calls for plenty of Brittany though, so it'll be a good time to take the kids to the water park. Anyway, time to bring some women into this sausage fest. See, there are no ladies in No Name City and the town is suffering from a blue balls epidemic, which is why the arrival of a Mormon traveler with not one but two wives creates an enormous turnout. Do something! Do something! Do something! Well, now the miners don't think it's fair that one guy is hogging all the women folk, and the only logical conclusion is to engage in a little white slavery. Your mule's slave, and I got a beauty that cost me $140. I'll swap you straight, my mule for one of your wives. After some deliberation, I am going to call sin number three on this plot point. Yes, this movie was made in the 60s and is set in the 1840s, so it's not like I expect any progressive gender roles. And they do take pains to show that Elizabeth, the wife on the block, is going along with this of her own free will. And simplify your life, Jacob, sell me. But Elizabeth, you don't know what you'll get. I know what I've had. But there are still some squirmy moments during the sequence, especially after a more drunk than usual Rumson wins the bid and the two are summarily hitched. It's not easy watching Elizabeth's obvious discomfort played for laughs, especially when the wedding march sounds more like a dirge. Nor does it help that their union is couched in the language of a mining claim. 
We have gathered together to grant this man, Ben Rumson, exclusive title to this woman, Mrs. Elizabeth Woodling, and to all her mineral resources. Hey, what she does with her mineral resources is between her and her doctor. But nobody is stupid enough to try and sell Lee Marvin raping a woman half his age in a comedy, so Elizabeth lays down the law. She'll be a proper wife for him and do all the usual feminine duties, but in return he has to treat her like a human being and not a mobile badge unit. Also, he has to build her a proper house so that when his wanderlust eventually takes hold and he leaves her, she'll at least have a roof over her head. And one dissolve later, she's happily singing her contentment with the new arrangement. Roll up the planes, there's too much view for me. There's so much space between the waiting heart. And the sad thing is, this is the best voice among the three main characters. Having access to the only double X chromosome in a 90 mile radius makes Ben crazy jealous, so a town meeting is held to decide how to keep him from killing somebody. The good news is a group of French prostitutes will soon be traveling through the area, but the bad news is they're destined for the next boom town over. Is it your proposal, Mr. Rumson? that we knock out the stage driver, steal a coach, and kidnap six women? Hey, it worked for seven brides for seven brothers. You mean you oh, silly Jane man! Come on, you're out of order! What? I yield the floor. Sweet Lucifer, this is worse than the Senate scenes in the Star Wars prequels. Who knew minors were such sticklers for Robert's rules? Long story short, everyone agrees that a little kidnapping can only do the town good, and Rumson sets out to lead the abduction party, leaving Elizabeth in partner's care. Now you don't expect me to leave a feast like Elizabeth alone in the middle of all this famine. Who can I trust if it ain't you? Which means partner and Elizabeth should be falling for each other right about... Oh, well, that was fast. This brings up sin number four, the awful plot development. It's as if the writers had no understanding of what was important to the story. There are drawn-out, theoretically comic sequences like the town meeting and the stagecoach heist, which don't contribute anything for the story and take forever, and... There's a coach coming in. Hurry, hurry, do you hear? Oh, I forgot why I was so angry all of a sudden. Oh, right. Meanwhile, the parts that would allow us to get to know and like the characters are glossed over, especially the development of Elizabeth's relationships with Ben and Pardner. She doesn't spend enough on-screen time with either of them to convince us she cares for them, certainly not enough for how she handles the situation. See, Rumson is none too pleased to learn Pardner and Elizabeth have been out talking to the trees while he was away, so the two men end up duking it out. A symbol crash. Seriously? That's it. The slapstick humor is getting sin number five. Marvin and Eastwood are not suited for it, and neither is the art direction. The movie looks like a gritty western with lots of dirt and mud and rough living types, but the script plays like a broad comedy. It's like trying to shoot blazing saddles on the set of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and it's only going to get worse from here on out. Rumson and Pardner argue over which of them gets to do the noble thing and leave, but Elizabeth loves them both, so she decides, hey, why not have a threesome? Woman can't have two husbands. Well, I was married to a man who had two wives. Why can't a woman have two husbands? And the men figure, sure, it's the lawless West, so why not? Again, this is an idea that's not developed well enough to pay off. There's never enough chemistry between the three characters to make their little menage a trois believable, and the arrangement is never explored well enough for it to reach its comic or dramatic potential. Elizabeth, in particular, changes her opinion on the situation based on the demands of the script, as we'll soon see. In the meantime, the establishment of a steady sex trade has done wonders for the no-name city economy, and before long it is a bustling haven of vice, gambling, and all the other things that make life worth living. There's just one thing missing. A strident, self-proclaimed moral guardian spitting on everybody's fun. No name city, no name city, the Lord don't like it here. No name city, no name city, your reckoning day is near. You know, if the Westboro Baptist members sang all their protests, they... Well, they'd still be horrible attention-whoring bottom feeders, but at least they'd be mildly entertaining. But there's a matter more pressing than eternal damnation, as the claims have started running dry and our happy trio might not have the funds to make it through the winter. 
Sounds like it's zany scheme time. Way too far down, I can tunnel up and get some of that gold dust that's been falling through these floors. How do you figure we can dig a tunnel without being seen? Wait, are we starting a whole new movie? Sin number six for introducing a bunch of new plot elements on top of the already underdeveloped old plot elements. We set up this love triangle between Ben, Elizabeth, and Pardner, and then we veer away from it to follow the fire and brimstone spouting parson and the tunnel under the town for Gold Caper. There are at least two or three ideas here that on their own could sustain an entire film, but instead they all get lumped together in a strange mishmash of a story. But wait! There's more! Right, there's also this La Caja Faux-type plot where Elizabeth ends up housing some settlers who get caught up in a winter storm, and she suddenly gets embarrassed about the whole polyamory thing and kicks Rumson out of the house so she and partner can play at being a normal couple for the sake of appearances. Ben amuses himself in the meantime by corrupting the settler's son, Horton. Grace, uh, I give you the boy. Give me back the man. This leads to one of those scenes where everybody tries to have a nice, polite dinner, but the personalities keep getting in the way. You had to take your revenge out on the virtue of this boy. Virtue? Show him what an ugly town this really is. Well, if this is the only place we can live, then we're ugly, too. This is an abrupt turnaround for Elizabeth, especially since she was the one who proposed the arrangement in the first place. How does she go from being all, okay, sure, I'll shack up with two guys, to, no, this is dirty and wrong and we're horrible people? It's inevitable that the movie would end up promoting the monogamous status quo, but you still need to establish why the relationship doesn't work and how the character's perception of it changes. Elizabeth ends up kicking both Ben and Pardner to the curb, so they end up bumming around town gambling and singing songs. What? Can stop that itching ain't around the kitchen. Gold, gold, hook am I? Susanna, go ahead and cry. But wait, there's more. Yeah, there's also a barren bullfight going on, which causes the parson to kick up a big stink because it takes place on the Sabbath, and he declares that the entire town is due to be swallowed by the earth. Speaking of, you don't think all those tunnels Ben and company have been digging everywhere have weakened the... <laughs> no Name City begins to fall apart, and so does the rest of the movie. You can almost hear the writer's desperation as they try to think up a big spectacular set piece for the ending, eventually throwing up their hands and saying, who cares, let's just have a bull chase people through town and knock everything over. Mostly it's an excuse for more wackiness and wild takes. And then after playing the whole destruction of the town as a joke, it tries to make us feel sad about it. Oh, whoa, the dreams of wealth and hedonism are dashed to pieces in the mud. Still, that Lee Marvin, what a character, huh? With No Name City gone, the prospectors are moving on, leaving the area to the settlers coming in. And Ben's leaving too, because he can't stand to be near people. And vice versa, no doubt. But Pardner and Elizabeth are staying behind to set up a homestead, leading to a touching scene where Pardner finally reveals his name. Sylvester Newell? Sylvester Null. Yeah, just one L. Yeah, with a name like that, I'd well, stick with Partner problem. too. And so the movie ends where it began, with a bunch of guys not knowing where they're going or when they're going to get there. Which is fitting, because the audience has no infernal clue of where it's been. Where am I going? I don't know. When will I be there? I am certain. least, Paint Your Wagon does have a good score, especially when Harv Presnell or the chorus sings it. Even the additional songs by Andre Previn aren't half bad, particularly the Parsons' catchy Gospel of No Name City. 
but the leads are ill-equipped for their roles and don't play well off of each other, the plot is all over the map, and the art direction is too grim and dreary for the broad comic antics. They Call the Wind Mariah is gorgeous, but the rest of the movie never lives up to it, so the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For their unendurable vocal performances, we condemn Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin to judge an open mic night consisting entirely of drunken Hell's Angels. For the meandering, dull plot, we condemn screenwriter Patty Chievsky to be trapped in a doctor's waiting room where the only reading material is The Scarlet Letter, Crime and Punishment, and The Wild Boys. Finally, to the producers, for casting Harf Presnell and then doing so little with him, I think I'm going to go old school on this one. Does the name Tantalus ring a bell? So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned, and I want to hear that song one more time. Away out here they got a name for rain and wind and fire. The rain is Tess, the fire's Joe, and they call the wind Mariah. Mariah blows the stars around and sends the clouds a flying. Mariah makes the mountain sound like folks were up there dying. Mariah, Mariah, they call. 